Well, good morning and welcome to each of you. The Lord has given us a wonderful day to be able to gather and worship our Christ. And we do want to offer to Him all that we have, our faith, our love, our hope for the future. Well, let's take our Bibles and turn to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And here Paul reminds us of this glorious truth of the resurrection. In the Apostles' day as well as in our own day, there are many skeptics. And so Paul speaks very clearly to those who would scoff at this message of the resurrection of Christ. Let's begin our reading in 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 12. Now if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified about God that He raised Christ whom He did not raise, if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. But each in his own order, Christ the first fruits, then at his coming, those who belong to Christ. Well, we have these glorious truths as the foundation of our faith as we come today to God in worship. Let's bow together in prayer. Heavenly Father, as we come to You today because You have called us to come, we come trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ, believing that His death has paid our, the price of our sins in full, has removed Your wrath from us. There is now no longer any condemnation. We rejoice in that. And we thank You for the resurrection of our Lord Jesus. And for the power that comes to us as a result of that glorious act. O oh, our God, help us to worship You today, resting on Christ. And we also would rely upon that promise the Lord Jesus gave about the Holy Spirit. Thank You that He has come in power. Thank You for Pentecost. Thank You for His enduring work in this world. O oh, our God, Grant to us today that we would know the work of the Spirit in our hearts. And that as we bring our worship to You today, we would bring it with heavenly power because the Spirit is working in our lives. We ask all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let's take our red hymn books now and turn to number 184. 184 and the very simple text from Luke 24 he is not here he has risen <laughs> 
reading of God's Word this morning, let's take our Bibles again and turn to the Gospel of John, chapter 19. On Friday, we, Woody read some of this chapter to us as we were reminded of the death of Jesus. And this morning, we're going to begin in chapter 19 and verse 38 and the record of the burial of our Lord Jesus. And then we'll go into chapter 20 and read part of the resurrection narrative. John 19 and beginning at verse 38. After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate gave him permission. So he came and took away his body. Nicodemus also, who earlier had come to Jesus by night, came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds in weight. So they took the body of Jesus and bound it in linen cloths with the spices, as is the burial custom of the Jews. Now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden. And in the garden, a new tomb in which no one had yet been laid. So because of the Jewish day of preparation, since the tomb was close at hand, they laid Jesus there. Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid Him. So Peter went out with the other disciple, and they were going toward the tomb. Both of them were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. And stooping to look in, he saw the linen cloths lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb. He saw the linen cloths lying there, and the face cloth which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went in and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to their homes. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. And as she wept, she stooped to look into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and one at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid Him. Having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and that He had said these things to her. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. 
If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. Now Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails, and place my finger into the mark of the nails, and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here, and see my hands, and put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. What an encouragement for us that even though we weren't there to see with our eyes the Lord Jesus risen from the dead, He pronounces a blessing on us that even if we haven't seen and yet have believed, uh, God's blessing of grace is on our lives. Well, this morning as we go to God in prayer, I want us to remember our unsaved loved ones. I think we're all in that position of having ones that we love, whether parents or siblings or children or neighbors or friends who don't know the Lord Jesus Christ. And they would look at the truth of Christ's death and resurrection and and laugh and not believe it. Well, we want to pray for them that God would have grace on them as He had upon us. And then I also have some difficult news to share with you this morning. Just this morning, I received news about Rosalie, and she's been diagnosed with cancer. We don't know any of the details. There's going to be more tests, of course, to just determine exactly where it is and what needs to be done. But one of the saddest things, of course, is that Rosalie is all by herself in the hospital. And so let's pray that the Lord would draw near to her. And then, of course, Scott, separated from his mom at home, uh, let's seek to reach out to him as well. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank You that we can sing about this wonderful truth that Christ is indeed risen from the dead. We thank You that our Savior has overwhelmed death and conquered it, and even is now at Your right hand, ruling in this world. And Father, we would come and thank You that You have given us faith to believe. We know, our God, that we're not here today trusting in Christ and His death and resurrection because we're smarter than anybody else. We know, our God, it's because You have favored us. You've rescued us from our sins. You've raised us from the dead. And You've given us new life in Christ. And we rejoice in that. And we ask, our God, that You would have mercy on our loved ones. You know those that we're burdened for, our family members, neighbors, work associates, people that we love. Our Father, we ask that You would have mercy upon them as You've had upon us. And we ask our God that You would even use us to be witnesses to them and that they might see in our lives that we've been changed through the work of Christ. And Father, You would give us opportunities and and words to speak to be able to point them to the Savior. Our Father, we are grieved to hear this news about Rosalie and ask our God that as she's alone there in the hospital that You would draw near to her and that You would flood her with a sense of Your presence today. May she know that the Lord Jesus, by His Spirit, is right there with her in the hospital room. And we ask our God that You would encourage your heart, help her to be able to look to You for her future, 
Help her to know, our God, that you have recorded in your book every day that you've ordained for her and that her life will not end until it's your perfect will. Father, how we pray for the doctors as they would perform different tests and seek to figure out what exactly it is we know that even tomorrow they're going to put a stent in so that she can f swallow food and get more nutrition into her system. We pray that you would bless that surgery and make it effective. How we ask our God that you would minister to her during this time. And we think of Scott as well and we pray that you would draw near to him and comfort him and the rest of the family as well. We know, Lord, that this must have hit them hard and we pray that You would minister to them and help them all to be able to look to You and trust in You, our God, for their mom and for her future. And Lord, we know for us, this is another call to come alongside and to seek to bear the burden that You have placed on our sister. Lord, we know that this is not going to be finished in a couple of days. So we pray that You would grant to us grace to persevere alongside of her and seek to shoulder this burden and minister to her and seek to alleviate her suffering in any way possible. Heavenly Father, You have placed us in a very unusual time as a church. A small church now with two women suffering from cancer. And in these days of COVID where we have such restrictions on us, please help us, our God. Please deliver us from this situation that we might better be able to minister to one another. Lord, have mercy upon us. And in this time of trial, show Your grace and how You are able to strengthen Your people and bless Your work in days of trouble. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let's again take our red hymn books and turn to number 189. Again, a very simple hymn reminding us of the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ and asking especially that through the ministry of each one, each member of the Trinity, that we would know the risen Christ. Hymn number 189, It is true, the Lord has risen. <laughs> 
life. You will make me full of gladness with your presence. Brothers, I may say to you with confidence about the patriarch David, that he both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Being therefore a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants on his throne, he foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of the Christ. But he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God raised up, and of that we are all witnesses. Being therefore exalted at the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, He has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he himself says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus, whom you crucified. Now well, let's again see God's face in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you that you've given us your word and that we have a sure record of your great redemptive acts in history. We thank you most of all for this record of our Lord Jesus Christ and what he accomplished by his death and resurrection. Thank you, our God, that that work reaches all the way down to us today and it is still working. And how we pray today, our God, that as the gospel is being preached all over the world, that you would save many sinners, and that you would cause your kingdom to come, and that the tents of Zion might have to be stretched out because so many people are being included. Oh, our God, we look to you today for a great work even here in our midst. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now this morning is really part two of what we began on Friday morning, looking at Peter's sermon on the day of Pentecost. You remember the setting that, well, we didn't read about it this morning, but we did on Friday morning and considered how on this day of Pentecost, the Lord Jesus Christ, having ascended to heaven, poured out on his disciples the Spirit of God that the Father had promised to send. And there was all that incredible, supernatural, physical phenomena. The sound of the wind, the flames of fire, or what looked like flames of fire resting on the heads of the disciples, and then the speaking in tongues. Not strange, unknown tongues, but the languages of all of the Jewish people gathered from around the Roman Empire who had come to Jerusalem for this Feast of Pentecost. We saw that Peter began his sermon, really a spontaneous sermon, with a vindication of the disciples. Some who had gathered and were listening to these languages and knew that these people were uneducated Galileans, laughed at them and said it's just because they were drunk. And so Peter begins with a vindication quoting from the book of Joel, that hundreds of years before, God had prophesied this coming of the Spirit and this great physical phenomenon. And so this was something not unexpected. And then he began, and this is where we focused in particular, in declaring the awful death of Jesus on the cross. That it had been planned by God and accomplished by wicked men. Now thankfully, even though we ended there on Friday, that was not the end of Peter's sermon, and that is certainly not the end of the story, because as you see from our reading this morning, having declared this terrible death of the Lord Jesus, he went on to declare 
Christ's glorious resurrection. And that's where we want to focus this morning, upon the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, and ask the simple question, how did the resurrection of Jesus happen? What brought it about? What are the details that Peter speaks of here? And so, concerning the resurrection this morning, we have three simple points. First of all, God did it. Secondly, the scriptures prophesied it. And thirdly, the apostles witnessed it. So let's begin thinking about the resurrection with this point, God did it. Now, throughout the Bible, especially the New Testament, the resurrection of Jesus is attributed to the work of the entire Trinity. You can find texts of Scripture that attribute this to God the Father. You can find Scriptures that attest this to the work of Christ Himself and also to the work of the Holy Spirit. Jesus, for instance, said in that great Good Shepherd discourse in John 10, for this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my Father. So there the Lord Jesus is saying, he's going to lay down his life, he's going to take up his life again. The Apostle Paul, in speaking of the Lord Jesus at the beginning of his letter to the church in Rome, points to the work of the Holy Spirit in the resurrection of Jesus. Concerning Jesus, Paul says, and was declared to be the Son of God in power according to the spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, here in Acts 2, where Peter simply speaks of God, when you consider the whole context of this message and some of the references that Peter makes in this passage, he seems to be pointing to the resurrection in terms of the work of God the Father. And so Peter can say very plainly, before all of these people gathered, God did it. God the Father performed this miraculous work in the dead body of Jesus, putting life back into that body and bringing him out of that tomb of death. Now, Peter used some very descriptive terms in order to speak of this glorious work. In terms of the resurrection of Jesus, Peter says that God loosed the pangs of death. Now, this word translated pangs or, or agony or just pains is a word used in the first century to, to describe the birth pains of a woman going through labor. Those of you who are women and who have been through this experience of labor and delivery probably can vividly remember when those labor pains would grip you and when they had you firmly in their grasp. Peter says, that's what death is like. It comes and it takes hold of you in its very firm grip. We can perhaps picture that in the records of the death of our Lord Jesus. Think of him hanging on the cross and taking his final breaths and then handing his spirit up to his Father. His body is taken down from the cross. And then the disciples, Nicodemus and Joseph, come and they wrap that body up in all of the linen and the spices and they lay it in the tomb. The physical body of Jesus was firmly in the grasp of death. But you, then you have this very picturesque language. Although, as though God, in his almighty power, took hold of the hands of death and began to unloosen its grip upon that dead body. And then joining the body and soul of Jesus together and breathing life into that body just as he did 
to Adam back at the beginning of creation and causing Jesus to stand on his feet and walk, walk out of that tomb. He follows it up with this comment, because it was not possible for him to be held by it. Now he doesn't really explain what he means by that, but I think it's pretty obvious what Peter is saying. Death is no match for God. When God takes hold of death's hands and loosens them, there is no contest. Death must let go. It is impossible for death to maintain its hold. And so, in this very brief but powerful statement, Peter declares that Jesus rose from the dead because God did it. God exercised his almighty power and brought Jesus out of that tomb alive again. Now that brings us to the second thing that Peter tells us about the resurrection, that the scriptures prophesied it. The scriptures prophesied it. Now it would be one thing for Peter to stand before those thousands of people on Pentecost and declare that God would raise Jesus from the dead. But people want proof. And the Jewish people of the first century were no different. How could they know that Peter's words were true? And that the rumors spread by the soldiers about Jesus' body being stolen weren't actually the truth. Well, Peter was standing before these thousands of people who confessed to believe the word of God. Jewish people might have all kinds of different understandings about what the Old Testament had to say, but one thing for sure, they believed in the Scriptures. They believed in the Word of God. And so Peter appeals to that as he would bring them proof about the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. He appeals to their confession of the Scriptures by referring to the Bible. And essentially, he said to them, we shouldn't be surprised at such a resurrection. The scriptures prophesied it many centuries ago. God had said that it was going to happen. Now as Peter reached back into the Old Testament to appeal to one of the prophets, he chose someone that we wouldn't normally think of as a prophet, David. David, of course, was a shepherd, a warrior, a hero in Israel, and Israel's mighty king. But according to what Peter says here, he was also a prophet. And God used him, especially in the writing of the Psalms, to give us some of the most wonderful prophecies about the coming Messiah. And so, here in verses 25 to 28, Peter quotes from Psalm 16. Now when you examine these words that he's quoted from Psalm 16, they don't say anything explicitly about resurrection. But they do speak here of an experience of death. Look at verse 27. For you will not abandon my soul to Hades, or let your Holy One see corruption. Hades here refers to the grave. And that is confirmed by the second phrase where David speaks of corruption. It's when a body, having died, is placed into a grave and it begins to decay. It begins to be corrupted. And so David speaks of this experience of death and burial in the grave. But according to what he says here, God has not left him in death. For these verses speak of an experience of joy in the presence of God following death. In other words, after this death experience, he's in heaven with God. He's at God's right hand, or, or God is at his right hand. God is as close as his right hand. And he's filled with joy to be there with God, to experience that glorious reality of the presence of God in heaven. And it's not merely that his soul has gone to heaven, 
as would be the experience of any saint in the Old or New Testament. But it's clear that this going to the presence of God included his body. In verse 26, he tells us that as his body went into the grave, his flesh was full of hope. And in verse 27, there's God's commitment not to leave him in the grave. So even though it isn't stated explicitly, this passage demands a resurrection. Now Peter goes on in the following verses that Luke records for us to explain this uh, in his sermon. And to say very clearly to the people, even though David wrote this passage, Psalm 16, and wrote it as though it were a personal experience that he had gone through, the apostle makes it very plain, David couldn't be speaking about himself. And the plain, obvious reason is, David died. And he was buried right there in Jerusalem. And if you had been there listening to the sermon, you could have gone from Peter's sermon to the graveyard of the kings, and you could have found Peter on uh, David's grave. He was there, buried in Jerusalem. But God had made a covenant with him, what we call the Davidic covenant, uh, recorded in 2 Samuel 7. And in that covenant, God had promised to David with an oath that one of his descendants would always be seated on his throne. And then here comes the prophetic part. David probably didn't understand this himself, but speaking through the leadership of the Holy Spirit, he pointed forward to the Messiah, to Christ, that he would die and that God would not leave him in the grave, but raise him up and ultimately to exalt him on his throne in heaven. And so we find Peter taking them to the scriptures. He's declared, God did this thing. And if you want further proof, it's right here in the word of God. God prophesied it centuries ago that this son of David, the Lord Jesus Christ, would die and be buried and then raised up to the very heights of heaven where he would know joy in the presence of God. And so, basically, in his sermon, Peter is saying, look to the Word of God. If you need to be persuaded, that will give you the truth about our Lord Jesus Christ. And of course, Peter is an excellent example for any preacher in his sermon. He starts the sermon by quoting scripture. He quotes scripture through the sermon. He points people to the proof of the word of God. He knows that it's God's word that can persuade people's hearts. So, the resurrection of Jesus. God did it. The scriptures prophesied it. And now thirdly, the apostles witnessed it. Along with this declaration of the work of God and this reference to the Old Testament prophecy about the resurrection of Jesus, Peter has also included this eyewitness testimony. In other words, he's standing there and very possibly the other apostles with him and he's saying, we, the apostles of Christ, witnessed his resurrection. Now, they had not been there to see the actual event when Jesus walked out of the tomb, but Jesus obviously had told them about it. And they had seen him with their own eyes, they had touched him with their hands, they knew that he was real, they had sat down with him and eaten meals, they knew that he wasn't just a spirit. And at the time appointed by God, they had been with him as he went up from heaven out of their sight with that promise to return again. Now this testimony that Peter gives here of their eyewitness experience is very similar to the Apostle Paul's statement when he reminds the Corinthian church of the gospel 
In that text we read from in 1 Corinthians 15 this morning, Paul says this, For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that He was buried, that He was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures, and that He appeared to Cephas, then to the Twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. So Paul, in bringing forth his declaration to, of the gospel, offers the eyewitness declarations of over 500 people. Not just a couple of people, not even just two or three, which God in His Word demands to prove the truth of something, but over 500 people who had seen the Lord Jesus and were ready to give eyewitness testimony to the reality of Christ's resurrection. Now, though it's something that Peter doesn't appeal to here, it's very clear from his testimony and the agreement of these other apostles who stood with him that these men had been changed by the resurrection of Jesus. They weren't simply eyewitnesses. They were men whose lives had been transformed because Jesus had come out of the tomb, ascended to heaven, and sent the Holy Spirit. They were no longer fearful and timid men running away from danger, but they were willing to stand before this crowd, many of whom could be accused of killing Jesus, and declare with absolute certainty the resurrection of Christ. So there was something different about the men who were standing before them that even appealed to the reality of the resurrection. They would go on to preach the gospel throughout the Roman Empire and see the world turned upside down because they had experienced the death and resurrection of Jesus. They would be willing to lay their lives down in death because they knew that these things were true and that what Christ had accomplished in death and resurrection had changed their lives. So their witness would become a crucial part of the gospel message. And in many ways, brethren, we are here this morning Believing in the resurrection of Christ because of the witness of the apostles. Why do we know about this glorious truth? Well, because Peter told us, and Paul told us, and John told us, the apostles in union have declared this truth, and God has brought us to believe it. So, here in this Pentecost sermon, as Peter declares both the death and the resurrection of our Lord Jesus, in terms of this glorious work of resurrection, Peter is saying, God did it, the Old Testament scriptures prophesied it, and we stand here as witnesses to this great reality. Now, what are some of the lessons that we can take to heart because of this great truth? Well, as we contemplate what Peter is preaching here, we certainly are reminded of this truth, that we have a Savior who knows what it's like to die. We have a Savior who knows what it's like to die. The death of Jesus, of course, was unique in that his death was for us. He was dying not for himself. He was dying in our place. And of course his death has a redemptive power that reaches through the centuries back and forward to save a multitude of people that no man can number who will one day all be gathered in heaven around the throne of God because he died on the cross. So there is obviously uniqueness about the death of Jesus. 
But in another sense, Jesus died just like every one of us have to die. We all know that's the reality of our lives, that unless the Lord Jesus returns first, we're all going to have to face this experience of death. And usually we tend to think as we live that it's something that is a long way off. We perhaps contemplate it now and then, but mostly it's not in the forefront of our minds, but we think that we always have lots of time to live. But the reality is, whenever it happens, Whatever comes, we're all going to die. We're going to experience this horrific reality of our bodies and souls being ripped apart and of our bodies being laid in the tomb. You all know that that is not something that we look forward to. We look forward to birthday celebrations, we look forward to family reunions, we look forward to glorious days in the life of the church, but we don't look forward to the day of death because it's not something that we look forward to with eagerness. We don't look upon it as something that is a happy event, something that we want to experience. But when we come to it, we need to remember that our Lord Jesus knows what it means to die. Death is a terrible enemy. The Bible makes that very plain. Jesus knew the reality of that terrible enemy. I'll never uh, forget how that truth was so impressed on my mind as I stood at the deathbed of my father and watched him over the course of several days die. It was awful. I prayed many times that the Lord would quickly take him and deliver him from that experience, but it lasted for quite a while. When it's our turn, we need to remember this truth, that we have a Savior who knows what it means to die. And we have a Savior who is at the right hand of God in heaven, both body and soul, and he's there to help us in our time of need. This description that Peter gives us here, the pangs of death, we're all going to go through that. But in that hour, we can look to Christ and know that he experienced those pangs of death and that he is willing to help us, that he will give us all the grace that we need, all the mercy that we need, as we cry out to him. But secondly, as we think about these truths that Peter brings to us this morning, we have a reminder that our Savior is alive, enthroned in heaven right now. When we remember Christ, we don't go to a cemetery. It's not even just a matter of reading our Bibles to remember the story of his life and death. The Bible charges us to look to Christ in heaven. What we've been studying in Colossians 3, Paul begins with these words, If then you have been raised with Christ, Seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. And then he reminds us, your life is hidden with Christ in God. Paul says, live your life looking to God in heaven. Get your eyes focused upon the Lord Jesus there. Even though with these physical eyes we cannot pierce through the clouds and see him, yet with the eyes of faith resting in the scriptures, we're to look to heaven and see our glorious Lord Jesus Christ, seated at the right hand of his Father, the Lamb, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, who is directing the course of history, even directing the course of our lives. And we keep our eyes on this one, 
who is alive forevermore. And because he is alive forevermore, he guarantees our resurrection. No, like I've already said, we're all going to have to go through the experience of death unless Christ comes first. But if we go through death, we have something incredible to look forward to. A day of resurrection. Of course, in the meantime, our souls will go to heaven to be with God. And that will be wonderful. But not as wonderful as resurrection will be. Because resurrection is what the Bible calls our glorification. It's the conclusion of our salvation. It's when our souls and our bodies are reunited in a glorious way and we are transformed in all of our being to be like the Lord Jesus Christ. Our Savior, who is in body and soul at the right hand of God, is guaranteeing that that will be our experience. He's the one who's gone ahead of us. He's the one who's accomplished that work. And he's the one who's going to make sure that on that final day, when the trumpet sounds and his voice goes out in awesome command, that we will rise from our graves and meet him with the air. And that will be better than anything we could ever imagine. So Peter and the rest of the New Testament urges us Keep your eyes fixed on Christ, who's alive in heaven forevermore. And then finally, even as I concluded on Friday, this glorious sermon means that anyone can come to Christ for salvation. Because our Lord Jesus, though he died and rose from the dead, that work is in the past. He continues to give to people this glorious salvation that he accomplished. In just a couple more chapters, when the apostles have another opportunity to, to declare this glorious truth, this is what they say in Acts 5. The God of our fathers raised Jesus, whom you killed by hanging him on a tree. God exalted him at his right hand as leader and savior to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are witnesses to these things, and so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. And so the apostles would tell us, look up to heaven and see the Lord Jesus, see him exalted there at the right hand of God, and see him, look what he's doing. He's giving repentance and faith to people. He's giving salvation to people. He's working in the earth to expand his kingdom and draw many more people in. And so if you're here today and you don't know the Lord Jesus, you don't know him as your Savior, you've never had your sins forgiven, this Savior who was willing to go to the cross and die, whose body was laid in the tomb, whom God rose up from the dead, this Savior, who is altogether glorious now, is willing to give to you his salvation if you ask him to do it today. What a wonderful Savior we have. How thankful we need to be that he is alive again and continuing to minister to his people. Let's bow in prayer. <clears throat> Gracious Father, thank you for this work that you planned even before the world began. Thank you that Jesus has accomplished perfectly, everything, every part that was in your plan. Thank you that even now, the plan goes on 
in the saving of sinners. And how we pray our God that this good news of the death and resurrection of our Lord Jesus wouldn't be merely some facts that go through our minds today, but it would be something that would build faith. Lord, for us who are already trusting in the Lord Jesus, we need our faith to be stronger. And so we pray that you would work in our hearts. And for those who have no faith, Father, come to them and in your grace give them this marvelous gift that they might look up to the Lord Jesus in heaven and ask him for the salvation that he is only too happy to give. We pray these things in our Savior's name.